Bugatti still was interested in performing as a consulting designer after he opened his own factory, uh, having regard to the fact that that's how he had existed up to 1910. And he produced a very interesting little tiny car with an 850, that's mini-sized engine, in 1912, almost like a shoe it was really. And he licensed this car to the Peugeot company and it became known as the Baby Peugeot which continued in manufacture even during the war, and no less than 3,000 of these were made, some coming to England. The next phase in the story is an interesting other diversion of his activity. He was still interested in producing a larger car, larger than the 13 or 1400cc car that he was producing in production in the period 1910 to 1914. He produced for himself a racing car with a five litre engine and used it in one or two odd competitions. Then he became friendly with a famous aviator who appeared, Roland Garros. He produced a version of this car for Roland Garros it was a, a five-litre engine, as I mentioned, and still chain-driven, because he was not by then convinced that there wasn't something in the chain drive. The great advantage for competition cars, obviously, being that you could change the ratio of the back axle much more easily than an ordinary car. And therefore, for competition work, there was some justification in retaining the chain drive. This was a superb car, produced with a body by La Bourdette, on the original print of this picture, you can actually read the maker's name on it. Now, uh, Garros, unfortunately, was killed uh, in the war, but the car remained and came to England in the early 20s and is still preserved and popularly called Black Bess, the name given it to by one of the lady owners, Ivy Cummings, who owned it and raced it very nobly in the early 20s. The engine is a handsome piece, overhead Valves, of course, typically Bugatti, with the magneto drive in the front. Here's the steering box, the carburation. In those days, interesting enough, they didn't believe in short carburetor manifolds. They had quite long pipes. But that car still goes extremely well. In Bugatti's search for more power, in 1914, he decided to build a special version of his little eight-valve engine with four valves per cylinder, something which nowadays our German and Japanese friends are extolling the virtues of. He produced three engines for a water rate race, which was unfortunately cancelled by the war in August 1914. But he buried the engines, or at least the top half of the engines, the new parts of the engine at Molsheim when he left for uh, Italy and then later France during the war, where he spent all his time designing air engines. Well, uh, these engines were dug up after the war when he got his factory back in 1920, and they put them on chassis and entered them in a race at Le Mans in 1920, where he won with what was at that time a sensational speed of 55 miles an hour. This created a sensation in the press because no small car at that time was able to be driven so fast. And uh, this really started Bugatti's reputation post-war as a maker of racing cars. And in the year following, he improved it still further by building some engines with roller bearings on the big ends and on the crankshaft, and entered five cars into the Brescia race in Italy for Waterrets, and came in and took the first four places at sensational speed. All this really cemented his reputation and got him into business as a successful producer of racing and sports cars. The success at Brescia led him to call the model the Brescia model, and forever afterwards it was known throughout its production run until it finished in the early 1926 as the Brescia Bugatti, in honor of the wing at Brescia. On this Brescia engine, you've got the cylinder block down here with its four valves two inlet and two exhaust. And on top of it, you have this aluminum casting, the cam box. In that rotates 
the camshaft. This is a typical camshaft. You can see the four cams here, two in it, two exhaust. And then the problem Bugatti had, indeed all engine designers have had, is how to transmit the motion of the cam into the actual pushing of the valve. The classic solution is some sort of rocker or finger which oscillates up and down to act between the cam and the thing. But Bugatti, with typical ingenuity, thought of a different solution. He had what we call, jokingly now, banana tappets. These are arc-shaped followers, rectangular in section, but arc-shaped in side view. And these operate on the cam, being pushed up and down by the cam as the cam rotates, the, the four different ones for the four different cams. And then at the other end, as they push up and down, this end operates the valves. These show the four valve centers. Well, he produced a batch of these little short chassis, so-called Type 13 racing cars, what was called in England the full brecher, or the genuine racing brecher. And two of them came to England fairly quickly. And the first one was bought by a young racing undergraduate from Cambridge called Raymond Mays, who successfully campaigned the car and was winning every hill climb there was in the period 1922 to 1924. Meanwhile, production of the more subdued and longer wheelbase touring models continued using the same 16-valve engine, although the engine was slightly simplified. It only had, for example, a single magneto rather than the twin magnetos which you had on the racing one. And that was actually the most successful Bugatti that ever made. They produced over 2,000, which is more than any other Bugatti model in the production run, as we said, up till early 1926. One advantage of the success that Bugatti achieved and all the publicity he was getting was that it interested other manufacturers in taking a license of the little car. First of all, Diato in Italy talked a bit and took a license, gave Bugatti some much needed money, although they don't appear to produce very many cars. There is one in existence still, as far as we know, in a museum in France, but otherwise the market has disappeared. The next license was to a firm called Rabag, the Rhein Automobile Bau in Germany, who took a license and made quite a few of these cars, which were rather pretty and, and quite effective, although they altered them slightly. They altered the radiator a bit to have a bulge on it, although basically it was similar in style and shape to the Bugatti one. He had always wanted to produce in production a, a two or even a three liter car. And his first essay into this field was in 1920 when long before he really had the means to do it, he produced a remarkable eight-cylinder, three-liter car called the Type 28. It had an eight-cylinder engine with two-cylinder blocks of a style which he was later to adopt for all his later cars until 1930, uh, with a cam box on top and now three valves, two inlets and one exhaust, as opposed to the four valves he'd had on the earlier car, or indeed the two valves he had on the pre-war car. And the three-valve design was to remain with him until 1932, when the big touring Type 57 took over with only two valves. It also had, interesting enough, hydraulic front brakes. Hydraulic brakes in those days, not by Lockheed, but by Bugatti. Other interesting technical feature of the car was that the gearbox was in the back axle of the car, which has some technical advantages of simplicity, although it does increase this, what was called the unsprung weight of the back axle, which has to bounce up and down. But you can still see that the typical Bugatti construction with the reverse quarter elliptic springs, which he had introduced by now on all his cars, and the typical rigid frame at the back, able to support coachwork. It was perhaps fortunate that Bugatti was not able to commercialize the three-liter car, which was called the Type 28 because the racing formula, which had been a three-liter formula up till 1921, was changed for 1922 into a two-liter formula. And this enabled Bugatti to start work on a two-liter engine, which was smaller and therefore rather nearer his production ability than the big three-liter one. Here's a shot of the first of his two-liter engines, which was very important from the historical point of view, because the whole layout of this engine forms the basis of his 
next few years production and indeed the famous Type 35 racing car which we come to later on. It had two cylinder blocks with a cam box on top, the same layout as the larger engine but obviously scaled down. And the crankshaft in this case was carried on three roller bearings for an eight cylinder engine which was adequate uh, for up to say 4,000 revolutions but was not good enough for very high speed. It worked well enough for the period. Another interesting feature of these cars was the use of a large cast bulkhead, which certainly improves the appearance. And in those days when he had his own foundry and the production runs were small, it was a good way of doing things. In this case, this is a production version where the dynamo is mounted on the bulkhead and driven by a belt from the rear of the camshaft. Now, the first of these eight-cylinder cars were actually built for racing. And this is his car entered in the 1922 Strasbourg Grand Prix. The body was built locally, not at the factory, and with this rather curious long tail. And indeed, the exhaust was taken out through the tail cone to the point at the end. And notice also the curious cowl put over to cover the radiator, which was something which was done for that race, but not used subsequently. Now, the cars actually had some trouble with their brakes, we mentioned earlier on. And in fact, one of the drivers, Monis Mori, did more or less the whole of the race on his handbrake. But they were quite reliable, not as fast as the winning Fiat's, but they came in third and gave ample, excellent publicity to Bugatti, which he used to good effect. Now, one of these cars was bought by somebody who was to be famous later on, Mr. and Mrs. Eunuch. And here's Elizabeth Eunuch who became one of the most distinguished Bugatti drivers later on. They bought one of these cars and had it rebodied in Czechoslovakia, where they lived in Prague. We are breaking the sequence of our story just a little bit, because here on the south of France, we've got an opportunity of taking some pictures of two unique Strasbourg cars, and in the background, the original five-liter car which Ettore Bugatti used and raced. You can see in these three cars the beginnings of an interest in streamlining. The long tail on the five liter behind here, which in fact had a cowl over the radiator originally for racing. And then one of the actual Strasbourg cars with its long tailed bulbous body, the exhaust coming out of the tail behind me. And then here close is a beautiful bodied single seater built for running at Indianapolis in 1923. There were five cars built like this with these rather nice offset bodies. Unfortunately, because of the steering being on the right-hand side, the offset for Indianapolis should have been on the other side. But nevertheless, it had a very clean body, which was designed in detail by a well-known French aircraft designer called Bechereau. This is typical of the early hydraulic brakes. Uh, using uh, glycerin and water mixture uh, as used on the early Type 30s and indeed on the racing cars at that time. There's the oil or liquid fluid entry here and instead of the double shoe arrangement of the modern hydraulic brake, there was a single shoe pivoted on one end and pressed by a single hydraulic cylinder to expand into the drum. Clearly, therefore, it only worked in a forward direction and hardly worked at all in reverse. The actual master cylinder was a remarkable affair. This is a sample with the reservoir of oil on top of this master cylinder and a direct push pedal mounted in the cockpit so you could push it down directly, there being no lever. This was merely a guide to stop it turning around. It was frankly the, the, the trouble with the seals on this item that prevented it being reliable. And although when they were working, they worked quite well, they, they always were giving trouble. Apart from being interested in cars, he was actually quite a sportsman. He loved horses, he was always riding. In fact, there are many of the early pictures show him in riding garb, and he had a reputation when he had a factory of his own of wandering about the factory in riding clothes. He always kept horses. In fact, later on in the factory, it was astonishing. There was an awful lot of time and money spent on the stables and the various trappings that go around with it. He even started building horse-drawn vehicles. <laughs> 
from the very earliest days, Bugatti seemed to be as interested in how things were made, to his satisfaction, as to what the parts they were making were. This meant that he spent quite a lot of his own time on the designing of the tools to manufacture the parts, the crankshafts and the cylinder blocks and things like that, which he just designed. This is unusual. In fact, I suppose it's unique in the car design world to get a manufacturer who's interested not only in the creation of the thing itself, but in the method of its manufacture and the tools to make the product with. This meant that, for example, his factory was full of specially designed machinery or fittings, usually attached to the best type of milling machine, many of which came from America, where the best machines were in those days. And he extended this actually to making the bench vices. All the vices throughout the whole factory were Bugatti designed and manufactured, rather large, heavy, very, very effective vices, the best you might call almost the Rolls Royce of vices, which are still much sought after, and anybody who's used one wouldn't want to use another type of vice.